Hi, and welcome to City Desk, a behind the scenes look at Santa Barbara's top local news stories. I'm your host, Jerry Roberts, joined by an all star lineup of local journalists for an inside look at these headlines. Santa Barbara politicians dive into a wild game of musical chairs. Angry gourmet vendors say they were duped by the city's showplace public market. One year after the IV rampage, a reform plan hits opposition. And the By God Los Angeles Times launches a vicious attack on Santa Barbara. <laughs> Are we really stodgy? Joining me from high atop the lavish South Salina Street World Headquarters of TVSB, Josh Molina, reporter for NewsHawk. Tyler Hayden, news editor for The Independent. Kelsey Brueger, staff writer for The Independent. And prize-winning columnist Starshine Rochelle. Thank you all for being here. Josh, Congressman Lois Capps' retirement announcement uh, set off a series of political dominoes in town. What are the key moves? It's always politics with you. Can we ever just talk <laughs> baseball? <laughs> Dodgers? This is the huh? year of the Dodgers politics or the Giants? Politics is the baseball of spectacling. Again, what are the key moves, Josh? <laughs> well, well, you know, the, sort of the latest in all this is Laura Capps has decided that she's, uh, she's not going to run, and that was a big mystery. Lois's so, daughter. Yes, has decided that uh, she's not going to run, and uh, that sort of um, uh, changed it a little bit. There's a lot of question as to if she runs, what does that mean? So now we have um, you know, Salud Carbajal, uh, Supervisor Carbajal. We have uh, Helene Schneider as uh, you know, two prominent Democrats who are going to be running for that seat. So it's, it's interesting. They both have great seats, and, and now they're going to be running for, for Congress. Uh, Helene's given up her, her spot to run for this. Salud's given up her spot, so his spot. So it's going to be interesting to see how, how all of this plays out. Uh, Salud seems to have the, um, the lead a little bit right now, at least in terms of early organization like it, yeah. and uh, infrastructure. He's come out with some pretty prominent endorsements. You know, he's got uh, uh, Supervisor Janet Wolf. Uh, he's got uh, District Attorney Joyce Dudley, uh, former State Superintendent of Schools Jack O'Connell, and uh, of other a lot of other heavy hitters. So, who's going to run for his seat? Well, right now, Doss Williams looks like he's going to run for county supervisor, and I don't know who else is going to jump in there, but that's uh, going to be a wide-open race, of course. You know. Do you think somebody else will get in? Well, I, I think so. It's not often that you have a, an opportunity to take, take a seat like that and take an open seat. So are there going to be other Democrats who get in there? I don't know. Uh, certainly, there's going to be some Republicans who are going to challenge him and, uh, and, and make that competitive. There, you know, there was some rumors, will Laura Capps run for that seat? That's not going to, you know, that's not something that looks like a possibility. Maybe school board for her. Uh, Helene Schneider. Wait a minute. What's, so what happens to Doss' seat? So Doss, assembly. So Doss, uh, he's going to be termed out. So he has to uh, decide what he's going to do next. So he decided to run for county supervisor. And uh, Monique Lamone from the Santa Barbara School Board is running for, for his seat. So there seems to be a little bit of uh, early uh, uh, maneuvering. Uh, Salud, Monique Lamone seem to be sharing some infrastructure, some fundraising. They're attending a lot of events together. Hmm. And uh, she's kind of, Monique Lamone is kind of cl claiming the assembly seat. And uh, Doss is claiming the supervisorial seat. And we'll see who comes who comes forward. You want to run? I think you Not should declare time. tonight for, <laughs> for supervisor. Huh? <laughs> you first. Starshine. No, I bet, I bet you have a, a name ID almost. Uh, that, that I'm going to loan it to you, and you run any, with I it. I don't have any name. Take it and run. Here's the thing. Das is, <laughs> what, what did we figure? We were talking before. Das has run for some office or another 68 times in the last six years or something <laughs> like that. Do you, is he going to vow, do you think, that he will not, well, he'll actually serve a full term if, if the state senate seat, for example, uh, that's now held by Hannah Beth Jackson comes open? I'm, I'm fairly certain that this will not be the final seat that Doss Williams <laughs> runs for uh, state senate, probably in his future. Uh, who knows? Who knows from there? Oh gosh, what are you what are you hearing about uh, Helene and uh, 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 Salute? And who do, who do you think's got the advantage? The early advantage here? Has the early advantage? You know what? I I 
I don't know. It's, it does sound like um, Salud um, has been pretty robust in his fundraising, um, and it sounds like, yeah, he has um, a lot of key um, consultants on his team. Um, uh, you know, at, at this point, I don't know. I think, you know, I know June 30th, I think, is when the fundraising money is due, the, the reports is due. So that'll be interesting to see at that point, um, you know, because you can speculate all you want. But then it's like when you look at the numbers, um, yeah. I think that'll be interesting. Do you think there's a chance Helene ends up not running for Congress? Well, <clears throat> she'll have to make that decision, and we'll have to find out how much money she can raise. Uh, we, we, we know already that he's got a more robust list of people endorsing him than, mm -hmm. than Helene does. Helene has Harwood, Bendy White on the city council, and that's one of her colleagues. Right. And Salud's already shown that he has some support. And the reason for that support that's really important is that it leads to financial contributions. Right. So <clears throat> I think that at some point, if it looks like somebody's distancing themselves, Maybe she decides to run for supervisor. Who knows? You know, you have to make that, that decision early. We, we would like that. Helena voting Doss. The, voting, yeah, let's vote for the story. That's what I think. <laughs> Plus, exactly. you've got a whole group of uh, liberal Democratic women who are not for Helene, led by Sarah Miller McCune, Susan Rose, Susan uh, Jordan, and others, uh, which can't help. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, it's, Helene is not the same Helene Schneider that she might have been three years ago, four years ago, in terms of the amount of people who once saw her as this rising yeah. progressive feminist in the community. Uh, you know, she, she very much feels like she's stuck to her values, but as we've read from various you know, articles and incidents that not everyone holds her in that regard. So it's going to be interesting to see if she's able to compete with Salud on that larger stage. Salud has endorsements already in San Luis Obispo County, yeah. Ventura County, as does, mm -hmm. Helena has, has some in Ventura, right. but not not as many. So if you're looking at it in terms of the first couple early rounds of this, Salud's ahead. All right, well fortunately we have two more years to follow this. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back. Um, Tyler, when the public market opened last year, it was with great fanfare, um, but now there's a number of tenants who say they were essentially deceived by the developer, by the corporate managers. What happened? Well, a year almost to the day after the market opened, one of the tenants filed a lawsuit against the owner and developer, and they are claiming that some of the points in their, in their lease agreement have not been fulfilled or have been sort of changing over the last uh, 12 months. One of them, one of the main points in the lawsuit is uh, what's called a triple net, which is part of a lease. It's kind of a wonky term, but it basically means that all the tenants cover the expenses of, of the space. So they have a base they rent. They have a base rent, and then they, and then they pay a triple net that they thought was going to be in a certain range, and it's actually twice what they expected to pay. Um, there's a, a, a number of reasons for that, from what I've been told. Mainly the building is just more expensive to run and manage than they thought it was going to be. Um, it's an LEED certified platinum building, and it's actually kind of more expensive in some ways. And it's in its unique, beautiful, big space. So there's a lot of sort of common area type expenses that these merchants are paying for that they didn't feel like they knew what they were getting themselves into. There was supposed to be a big opening, and the governor was supposed to. Come. That's what they say. In, that's what they said in the lawsuit. Yeah, that the owner promised uh, Jerry Brown would be there to to help cut the ribbon. Um, I think it's important to note, though, that there's only been one lawsuit filed by one tenant. Um, the other four who have retained the same attorney haven't filed any, any, uh, any legal complaints yet, but I think they're kind of watching to see how this one... And there's some happy tenants. Yeah, there are. There certainly are. Um, I, I don't know if it's split exactly even 50-50 uh, with who's happy and who's not, but there are people who are doing, I think, pretty well, but there's a lot of folks who are, who are losing thousands every month and uh, and they're upset by like I said not just the triple net but some of the some of the promises that were made either in the lease or verbally um, about sort of foot traffic numbers and and sort of generating buzz and marketing and getting people actually in there they think that if Jerry Brown had been at the ribbon cutting people would be eating more Jerry Brown is really cheap <laughs> he's really cheap he wouldn't right. have bought it <laughs> I don't understand how that would have helped them there, so the, the argument I mean I, I totally hear your point the argument in the, in the lawsuit is that um, there wasn't 
there was there was some fanfare, but there wasn't quite the the concerted push to get to get people in there, and that sort of the marketing that was promised, or sort of the you know the um, the word of mouth that that uh, the owners and the merchants thought was going to kind of start generating. Is, never is there any precedent for that of a similar business or development opening up and the tenants file a lawsuit? Um, yeah, and the. I, I almost hesitate to bring this up, but what I keep hearing this compared to is, is the Chapala one issue and sort of a, mm -hmm. an owner and developer, um, you know, kind of losing their shirt a little bit after, you know, there's this, there's this big buildup and obviously it's sort of different with commercial and residential. Right. Um, the, uh, the, the commercial lawsuits, though, I mean, it's a good question. I, I have not heard of anything specific in town, but, but tenants do sue Landlords every now and again, if they feel like their lease was broken, if you know, if they feel like they're, they were, uh, they were duped. So. You guys go to the public market? Anybody here eat there? How often do you go? I go about once a month. What do you I eat? Like um, I don't know. That's the nice thing about it is you can just decide to go there and then walk around and see what you feel like, what looks good, where you can get a seat. <laughs> but right. you, but you eat there. You don't buy stuff and take it home. I have done that, but more often I eat there. Yeah. Do you go there? I sometimes not. Super often, but I've, I've eaten at Empty Bowls. Mm -hmm. I like that. I don't think I've eaten it anywhere else. But you don't buy, you don't go there and say, I need some gourmet meat. I, I, don't, I don't do that. With some no. olive oil to that, fry it up. I, yeah, I don't, I don't sample olive oil and then <laughs> choose the one that I want. I, I've, I've been there, I've we've been there twice. Oil. Twice. We went once when it first opened. Did you eat there? Uh, no. We bought some fruit and had some ice cream. So I guess we ate there. We ate yeah. There. That was it. So who's supposed to be. Are the customers basically supposed to be people who live here, or tourists, or people off of cruise ships? Or what? Um, I think they thought they were going to get more tourists than they are getting. Um, they, uh, I think that the argument among some of the uh, some of the folks who were there is that is that the the place that the location of it is sort of hurting it, just because it's a little off State Street. It's a little bit higher up on State Street than than the tourists go. Um, so there's, I think there's that issue. I think some of the design elements that were, that were built were not quite um, exactly what people were envisioning when they thought of a, of a public market. They were thinking of something maybe a little more outdoors yeah, or more open. Or more open. Um, and, and that's qu not quite how it played out. And you were mentioning kind of the, um, the, the dining there versus buying buying uh, groceries, I think more people are, are using as sort of a, a food court a little yeah. bit um, as opposed to actually buying groceries to take home mm -hmm. and eat. And so the, the vendors set themselves up to be, you know, to sell groceries and now they're kind of having to, to change their whole business model to serve people who want to eat there and some are having a much harder time with it than others. Do you know what the part? solution is? What? In and out. Put in and out in there. <laughs> yeah, just take out the fruit Dive. and <laughs> put <laughs> it in and out. <laughs> All right. Um, so you think there'll be more lawsuits? Mm. If I had to guess, I would say there might be. Yeah. yeah. All right, Kelsey, the one-year anniversary of the IV rampage is approaching, what, uh, May 23rd? That's right. Mm -hmm. And uh, UCSB in the county already honored some of the first responders. Um, what are some of the other events planned, and what was that? that what was that? Event? Yeah, so um, that was sort of the first of a few. Um, there's also going to be, a, you know, candlelight vigils, memorial gardens, a paddle out, um, I think some chalk events, um, an exhibit in the library. Just, I, I know it's it's not orchestrated by the university. It's a lot of different student groups um, doing doing different things. I know one of them is this blue light. Um, it's blue. There, the idea is to set up blue LED LED blue lights all throughout IV, and so it would sort of glow and as a um, way to remember the candlelight vigil that took place about 24 hours after the shooting last year. So but those lights aren't going to stay there. It's just like it's one just night it would be like throughout the month of May. So I think they're just starting. And so. meanwhile, there's this push by Doss Williams to. Uh, basically have some self-government right. there. What's, uh, right. But that's so, kind of stuck, isn't it? Right. So what's interesting is that, you know, right at, it's, I think it's important to note that this shooting happened after not a great year for UCSB. There was um, Deltopia, riots, gang rapes. I mean, UCSB got sort of a lot of negative media attention um, last year. So 
it almost felt like the shooting hit rock bottom. So I think afterwards there was this attempt by a lot of different people and this f this urgency to do something, um, sort of act in this time because the you know this tragedy created this opportunity um, to do so. So you saw you know uh, Hannah Beth Jackson, Doss Williams uh, work together to come up with legislation um, about gun control. Um, right afterwards and so different things you saw UCSB Board of Trustees create this study um, to look at all the problems with Isla Vista and come up with these recommendations and on top of that list was um, this community service district so this idea that it's, n it's not a city um, you know it's so it's such a densely populated unincorporated area but what can we do to bring more services and create sort of a a watered-down city, if you will. Um, so Doss Williams sort of led the charge on that. Um, he has a bill called AB3. Um, it's, it's unique because typically uh, creating a special district goes through LAFCO, which is the local agency Everybody, formation okay. Drink, <laughs> commission. LAFCO. <laughs> LAFCO. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, and, and this bill doesn't have LAFCO as part of the equation at this point. Um, historically, LAFCO has been, um, has been involved in setting up special districts. LAFCO commissioners, most of them, are not happy about this. If you're AB3 supporters, you're saying LAFCO's never done anything to help Isla Vista. LAFCO has been a roadblock for change in Isla Vista. Um, but if your LAFCO commissioners are saying this bill isn't complete yet. Local Agency Formation, Formation Commission. Nice. Yes. Nice. Uh, there'll be a quiz on that later. <laughs> um, and uh, why isn't Ivy part of Goleta? Why, why, why isn't it in the city of Goleta? Um, so about, I guess, 13 years ago when uh, Goleta incorporated, they excluded Isla Vista. Um, the idea largely being that if you have several thousands of Isla Vista residents voting and on city, Goleta City Council, um, that wouldn't work out too well, possibly. Um, so, you know. I mean, they wouldn't be able to incorporate if they included the Isla Vista voters within the city limits? Well, if you have, you know, I don't know how many voters there are. I mean, I know there are about 25,000 residents in Isla Vista. As far as how many voters, I'd, I'd imagine maybe half of people are registered to vote. Um, all those people voting and then let's say you have a city council and uh, how many you know representatives from Isla Vista who are students who are only there for a few years on their city council you know I think that was the main concern and so people who were involved in the Isla Vista or in incorporating Goleta I think were told you know to exclude that like that would be a smart political move basically had they done district elections though Maybe that would. You, you, you were you were uh, out there the the night of the rampage, and you were there the morning after. Right. What what was that like? Do you still uh, is that still fresh in your? Um, it, it's funny you ask that. I it is, and um, it kind of came back in a big way more than I thought it would when I read the most recent sheriff's office report on that basically kind of wrapped everything up and kind of. Uh, was the final final uh, investigation laid out, and it was it was grim that night, of course, and heartbreaking, and kind of hard to to watch and to be a part of, and to sort of read it after the fact in such a sort of chronological um, order, and to sort of hear about some of the things that happened. Yeah, it's it was it was terrible. Um, I will say that the uh, that the the police and the the sheriff's office personnel and everyone who was out there was. Um, great to to work with from a media standpoint. I mean, they gave us everything that they could, and they sort of kept everyone in, as informed as they could. And for the sheriff to hold a press conference, I think at like three a.m. Mm -hmm. that night, mm -hmm. um, I think that was that was good for for everyone. Yeah, Bill Brown did great. You see, you know, these shootings, kinds of shootings around the country, and then the local lawman stands up, and sometimes they really kind of blow it. But he right. was he was very good. I thought. Right, right. And what was it like the morning after? The morning after was the was the weirdest thing walking around. I mean, I went to UCSB, I lived in Isla Vista, and just walking around that morning, just students, I think, were just in, didn't know how to act, I think. I mean, it, and it was it was really, really gloomy. It was like really kind of eerie. <laughs> um, so, 
you know, everyone was talking about it. You could just, you know, hear the chatter. There was nothing else to talk about, and it just, it, it felt raw. Yeah. Okay, well, that's a lot of uh, memorials coming up um, right. for it. All right, Starshine, the Los Angeles Times, another small failing daily newspaper in Southern California, uh, published a story this week describing Santa Barbara as stodgy. It did. What is, what is stodgy? Stodgy is dull or old-fashioned. Oh, you tell me, Jerry, what's stodgy? Well, it's boring, dull, uninteresting, <coughs> dreary, turgid, tedious, dry. I'm not describing city desk, by the way. Unimaginative, uninspired, humdrum, prosaic, and so on. So do you really think that's what... Well, talk about the piece. <coughs> so the article was about the funk zone, and it was, it was painting a picture of the funk zone being hip in contrast to what, what they said was uh, often stodgy Santa Barbara. And everyone at this table knows that, first of all, the writers don't usually write their headlines. But she had that word in the it, it She was did in the have piece. it in the piece, in the piece, at the very end. Um, but we also know that, you know, contrast creates drama. And so I think that the word stodgy, we're not not stodgy. <laughs> the so, you're, you, so you're defending. In I, other words, you're saying... I think that journalistically... It's sound because she was trying to create a contrast with the funk zone, which is very non-stodgy. But also, I think Santa Barbara can be a little dull and, and, uh, and old-fashioned. Let, let, let me disprove your argument. Please what do. What I like to call the Socratic method. <laughs> now, isn't it a fact that you have been repeatedly voted the best columnist in Santa I Barbara? I'm lucky to have been so, yes. And isn't it also a fact that you are the only columnist in the history of the world to write an entire column about synonyms for... The word vagina. vagina. I, I, I haven't I done the think? research, but I'm one of them, certainly. <laughs> now, would you consider that to be stodgy? No, that's not stodgy. That's not stodgy. But, you know... And people vote for it. I think it. people are... Talk, she's talking about... Cogent ergo sum. We are not stodgy. <laughs> I think that it's in I mean, the funk zone sprang up in direct and I think deliberate contrast to you know the Tony Biltmore's of Santa Barbara and the Shishi Couture boutiques and you know the things that um, that are moneyed and a little bit older and fun the funk zone is not that I don't know if you spend much time there but there's a bar named after the Seven Sins where you can get chicken and waffles and dance to disco you go, music. Do you go there more <laughs> or less often than you go to the public market? Oh, I'd say about equal. I'd say about equal. Yeah. yeah. Do you find parking there? No, parking is a disaster in both places. And back to the public market, why is there no parking? That's the thing. There is parking. There underground. is. There's parking underground. What? You, you would never know it. Right? What? There's parking underground. Yeah, the if, you, if you go down Chapala and you take a right into the parking lot behind the Arlington, there's a little ramp that takes you right underneath. Are there any cars oh. in there? Um, I, guess the I went employees. to go check it out, and there's two cars in there. And uh, So the not third. even the employees are parking there. Didn't they're not allowed to out of there yeah. it's for customers. It's free parking? Yeah. Well, I'm going to go there much more. Well, there's Tell a that pasta lady to look out because I'm a coming. <laughs> big tip, a full service show. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> all right, so uh, you said you went to the Lark, or where it was just called Lark. The Lark. The Lark, and yeah. that's a, that's like the best hot yeah, restaurant. Yeah, it was fantastic. It's, and how long did you have to wait? Um, well, I was the first time I went without a reservation, the wait was about four hours. <laughs> <laughs> what, <laughs> what time did you go? It was like it was like six or seven. Yeah. So it would have been a late meal. Did you hang around? No. That was it's a good. very LA feeling in that yeah. way. Yeah, but it's fantastic. I mean, we we went back and made made reservations, went back, and the food food was great. And that area is just, it's a fun place to hang out. And I was thinking, I mean, maybe partly what she meant by the word stodgy there is because the funk zone traditionally was a little more funky. Mm -hmm. And I think some people would argue it's less funky now. And mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't go as far to call it stodgy, but maybe that's what she was trying to Could get be. at. That's a little bit yeah. more mainstream than it used to be. It's an interesting article, though. I mean, it does talk about some of the issues. It's not—it's sort of plodding and not particularly artfully written. But um, no, she it's, <laughs> it's poor. Yeah, I mean, the bad writing pills handed she, out at the local. She didn't mention the word I, vagina. No, in the story. it's not in there. And therefore, <laughs> I didn't finish She's it. She's stodgy. It's so. stodgy. It's a stodgy <laughs> article. All right, it's time for the weekly drought quiz. Oh, well, is there, okay, is it really a quiz? I thought you were kidding. No, <laughs> no, no. All right, what is the most conserving city per capita in Southern California, Kelsey? Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara is exactly correct. 22% mm. as you know, Star, uh, conservation okay. compared, to the, <laughs> compared to the statewide average of what? Kelsey. 8%. <laughs> wow, Kelsey's been hey. Kelsey, <laughs> All right, Josh. I would, I would have guessed Montecito. 
just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> really? No, no, it's not that, a city. Now, Montecito is stodgy. <laughs> Maybe that's what she meant. Oh, <laughs> that yeah, yeah, yeah. Montecito is stodgy. All right, Judge, how much new water will we get from Lake Kachuma this year? New water? How many How many? No new water. Feet? No new water. Exactly correct. Yeah. Nice. You know that? No. How many times can you flush your toilet with an acre foot of water? I don't know. I'm busy looking at your notes trying to get the answer. 60,000. 60,000. I had the six, right? Serious? saw the yeah. six. Yeah. Wow. Or 30,000 short shots. Remember I told you last time you don't, don't need, need to flush. flush it. You just pour the water in. Wow. Well, yeah, yeah you, did, you did tell me that. Uh, Tyler, how many new swimming pools are put in, uh, in, in into Santa Barbara each year? New swimming pools? Yes. In San, the city of Santa Barbara? City of Santa Barbara. I'm going with, uh, going with 28. 14. Close, mm. but wrong. Mm. <laughs> Close, but double. <laughs> yeah. and, and the other night when they had a, a meeting about the new conservation, all but two of the people who turned out were from the pool and spa That's industry right. Right. To, com to complain with, uh, uh, about that. Uh, Starshine, how much of the for. Uh, urban <laughs> use of water is used for residential lawns? What percentage? Yes. 20s? Uh, 5%. Close, okay. but wrong. <laughs> and so this whole thing about making your lawn go brown, That's I mean, it's ridiculous the because they're still growing almonds. Not to bring up that old saw, but, you know, one, one gallon... Uh, all right, how many car washes a week does Helene Schneider want to allow you, uh, Kelsey? Two. Uh, wrong. Close, but wrong. One one car wash a week. Do you think that's too many? Who washes Should be zero. car every week? You don't need to wash your car. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't want like I don't wash. wash. But there, she, wa she wants the commercial car wash places to make sure oh, that no, uh, one, they that do no that? one brings their car more than so three, more than and once. Kick people out. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's what they do. Anyway, well, what does Salute Carbajal think of this? And last question, really <laughs> quickly: What percentage of Santa Barbara's heads will explode when they get their new water rates in July? Ooh, very high. I live in Galita, so I don't care. Well, <laughs> The answer is 100%. <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you all, Josh Molina, Tyler Hayden, Kelsey Brueger, and Starshine Rochelle. Thank you for watching, and uh, check us out on Facebook at SB City Desk. Send us an email if you want to hear something covered at SB City Desk at Gmail, and we will see you next time. Thanks again for tuning in.